When I do weddings, I almost always tell, well, I do always tell a story about the covenant because when it comes to the rings and the exchanging of names and gifts, people don't get it. We live in the 22nd century, no, 21st century. I've skipped, uh, <laughs> don't drink coffee when I make a mistake. I know, it was awesome. That was perfect. We don't understand covenants in this time, on this day, that the Lord has made. We don't understand covenants. Let me give you just one of the stories that I use sometimes when I'm doing a wedding. One of my favorite movies is Kevin Costner's Dances with Wolves. Remember that story? Remember that movie? Great movie. Great picture. Lots of beautiful scenes. And I've been studying covenants. And I know Dan's been studying covenants for a long, long time. And I'm going to read you a story of a covenant here in a moment, but let me finish my story that I use during weddings. You know, the, the, what are they called, Lieutenant 10? What was his name, Lieutenant something or other, uh, Kevin Costner's character. Anybody remember his name? Somebody at a wedding came up to me and says, I remember that name, and he blotted out the Indian name. Okay. It meant Dances with Wolves. And then there was this Indian, real long, beautiful black hair, and his name was Wind in His Hair. Remember that part of the movie? And I'll tell you if you didn't. And oh, he didn't like the Costner character at all. He didn't like that white man. And he didn't like him coming around. And it took a long time. And after a while, he saw the character and the quality of the soldier played by Kevin Costner. And eventually, he earned the respect of wind in his hair. And they were having a, I don't know, eating something rather around the fire one night. And wind in his hair came up to Kevin Costner and he said, he took off this, it's like a bamboo thing. And he gave it to Kevin Costner and put it around his neck. And I'm in, the, I'm in the theater and I begin to weep. I begin to weep because I understood what he just did. He said, all that I am, I'm second in the tribe. All that I have, all that I'll ever be, I give to you. You're my brother. And of course, all he could do was take off his army jacket and give it back. You know, it was kind of an uneven deal, but it was a covenant. A covenant. Listen to this story. Blood covenant in Africa. In 1869, everybody go. <whistles> the well-known missionary, Dr. David Livingstone, had been in Africa for many years. But little had been heard from him since 1866. Finally, the New York Herald called upon Henry M. Stanley to find him. Stanley was a journalist and an explorer, and it took him until 1871 to find Livingstone. That's three years. Four years. He greeted him with the now famous salutation, Dr. Livingstone, I presume. Remember that? But in the course of the search, Stanley had several occurrences in which he had to make a blood covenant with different African tribes. The first time Stanley was ill and he was under siege by a truculent tribe which he and his men were not able to fight, his interpreter asked him why he did not make a blood covenant with them. And it, he explained to him what it meant. But Stanley, as we can easily understand, was horrified at the thought of cutting himself and drinking another man's blood. However, conditions continued to worsen. So he asked, what would be the benefit of a covenant? What would be the benefit of a covenant? What's the benefit of teaching on covenant today? And he was told that it would put everything that the other tribe owned at his disposal, but it would also put everything he owned at the tribe's disposal. See, sometimes we forget that. God cuts covenant with us and he gives us everything. He gives us Jesus. He gives us the blood of the covenant. And all he asks back is everything. Amen? It's not like, well, Jesus come into my heart and I'll do what I want. Covenant, we don't understand. When we cut the covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ, everything he has, everything he is, is at our disposal. <laughs> Whoa! That'll change your prayer life. But... Everything you are, Bud and Kale, and everything you have are at his disposal. Is it a good trade? 
It's a great, she gets really smiling. Yeah, yeah. Not everybody lives that way. And that's why I'm teaching on it today. Not everybody lives this covenant relationship with the Lord Jesus. Let's see. Inherit in the agreement was that neither would exploit the other. They would not ask for anything unless it was critical. But at the initial making of the covenant, each would make the other a gift or give a gift. The nego negotiations ensued and the chieftain asked for Stanley's milk goat. Stanley didn't want to give her up because the goat's milk was important for his failing health. But since the chieftain would take nothing else, he finally agreed. In return, the chieftain gave him his seven-foot copper-wound spear. Stanley didn't think much of this gift at first, but later he found out that the spear represented some evident authority. Everywhere he traveled in Africa, people submitted to him because of it. Sounds like the name of Jesus, doesn't it? Isn't that a wonderful correlation? Stanley was relieved when he found out that he did not have to personally perform the ritual. This is also incredibly important. The chieftain used a stand-in from the tribe. Therefore, he was able to, therefore, Stanley was able to use a young Englishman as a stand-in for himself. Nevertheless, this in no way lessened the obligatory nature of the covenant. That covenant, we should understand, meant that if any one of the tribe was attacked, every person on the other tribe and everything it owned would be at its disposal. They'd be given weapons and food and shelter, and they would fight for them, give their lives for them down to their last drop of blood. Boy, wouldn't marriages be stronger if marriages recognized that they're actually entering into a covenant? That if your wife is attacked, husband, it is your obligation down to your last drop of blood to defend her. And yet people come into my office fighting, husbands and wives fighting. You don't understand this covenant, do you? No. You're supposed to be at each other's side. And it's like Linda said, when we got married, she says, what's yours is mine, is what mine is mine. <laughs> Did I miss, did I get that wrong? <laughs> it also meant that as familial, familial brothers, they were said to have the same blood because they shared the same parents. Those who entered the, in the ritual were ostensibly related, hence the term blood brothers. Remember when you were kids? Jim, did you do that? I had a buddy down the street. I got a cut and he had a cut. And it's kind of like, oh man, put your cuts together. Oh, we're blood brothers now. Oh, we're so close. I forgot his name. <laughs> Lived on Rewald Street. I don't remember which one. <clears throat> well, but it's true. They became literally blood brothers. To seal the covenant, the young tribesman from the African tribe cut his arm and squeezed it until the blood ran out into a goblet in which wine was already poured. Then the young Englishman made his incision on the arm and his blood dripped into the same goblet. <clears throat> Gross, <laughs> but powerful. The chieftain's priest stirred the bloods together, then handed the cup to the Englishman who drank part of it. The young tribesman drank the rest. Do we cringe at this ritual as we study it? Does it seem repulsive? Perhaps. But let us remember the one who said, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me. Who said that? Jesus. And today we're going to have a communion, holy communion service. And no, I don't go so far as some churches believe at the ringing of the chime that the, the wine or the grape juice literally becomes the blood. I don't believe it physically becomes the blood. But by faith, it sure does. And you can receive the blood of Jesus and that cleanses and forgives and heals. By faith, you understand. Or his body. I don't believe that the unleavened bread that we use, I don't believe it actually literally becomes the flesh of Jesus, but it sure is by faith important that when we take it and eat it, we're fulfilling what Jesus said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. He that eats of my flesh, it's actually the word. Amen? He is the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word became human. It says, Al, in that translation that you like, the New International Reader's Version, uh, John 1, 14, and the word became human. It was awesome. I love that translation. All right, let me finish this up. 
Jesus said in John 6, 56, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. In human practice, it might be hideous, but it gives us a reflection of a godly concept that goes far beyond our typical understanding about commitment. Man, what do we know about commitment in this day and age? We can learn a ton about commitment from Jesus, from his covenant with us. We can learn a ton about commitment from Mr. Stanley, who cut covenant with these tribes, and they became truly brothers and truly fought for one another. This goes beyond our typical understanding about commitment, the commitment that God has made to us, and that we have made, whether we realize it or not, to him. Today, I want you to realize it. I want you to realize your life is not your own. You've been bought with a price. Oh, I'm, I'm an American. I'm free. Now, you're a slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'd rather be a slave to the Lord Jesus Christ than a slave to the devil. Who's that guy? Uh, sings. He can hardly sing. Real famous. Bob Dylan. Thank you. <laughs> Who came up with that so fast? That was awesome. Did you? No kidding. Jesus knows. Bob Dylan reportedly gave his heart to Jesus a few years back and he recorded an album with some Christian music on it and, and one, of the lines of, one of the lines of the song says, you gotta serve somebody. <laughs> and it's true. Oh, I'm free. No, you're not. You're either a slave to sin and the devil or you're a slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in being a slave to Jesus, you'll find freedom. He's amazing. He knows how we're built, Jim. He knows what we like. He took me out of, I wanted to be a rock and roll star. You know, I was thin and hair down to hair and hair down to hair here. I wanted to, you know, and I got born again. I wanted to, you know, go to Cobo Hall and spit blood and preach Jesus, you know. I thought that was cool. Well, God had better ideas and he made a pastor out of me. And I love it. I love it. I do this a lot better and it's a hell of a lot more fun than it was playing in a rock and roll band and being up all hours of the night and traveling and playing in clubs, you know, five nights a week, nine o'clock till last call and, you know, playing your hearts out. You'll appreciate this, Brother Mark. We were playing in Goshen, Indiana, this club. We were upstairs and all the people were downstairs. It was a Friday night and we did... Right in the storm out. And we did the whole song. And at the very end, we went. And all we heard was clink, clink. Clink, clink. Picking up girls, clink, clink. It was so unfulfilling. People so didn't appreciate us. And you guys are a lot more attentive than that. <laughs> At least you say amen. You know? I don't hear clink, clink, buzz, buzz. You know, we're not paying attention to the pastor. Glory to God. He's preaching again. <laughs> oh, where was I? So God knew where I fit. And he made me, he put me in a place where I fit hand in glove. I just love this thing. Linda sometimes thinks I should be a stand-up comedian. But I get to be that on Sunday morning anyway sometimes because a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down doesn't it oh yeah oh yeah blood brothers next the African priest pronounced dreadful curses that were to befall Stanley and his men should they ever break the covenant and Stanley's interpreter did the same upon the Africans does this sound strange to us let us consider the curses and blessings that are part of the old covenant recorded in Deuteronomy chapters 11 27 and 28 which were shouted from Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal as the covenant was sealed. Let us also remember how in Exodus 12, 23, the Lord told the Israelites to put the blood on the lintel and the doorposts, and the destroyer would pass over them. Passover. And in Joshua 2, 8, where Rahab the harlot is told to put a scarlet red thread outside her window so she'll not be destroyed. All of this represents the power and the protection of the blood 
covenant. And today, you know, I, I can't do an exhaustive study. There's never enough time on a Sunday morning. But I'm giving you some scriptures. I'm giving you some direction. I want you to meditate on this. And I want you to do your own study. And I, I appreciate the fact that the Holy Spirit led Dan to do something similar in the, uh, the teaching this morning in the adult Sunday school class. Which, by the way, I recommend 930 adult Sunday school class. Uh, good word. Good word. All right, let me finish this up. <clears throat> they are now blood, blood brothers, and their agreement was meant to be in, indivisible. You can't break it. If one of them, however, did break the covenant, the other was then released from it. However, that was unlikely to happen in Africa because if a person broke a covenant, his own family would seek to kill him. It simply was not done. Great respect for the covenant that lacks in America. We need to learn about it. We're learning it from the scriptures today. Before this, Stanley's men had to guard all their valuables, but now no one would touch anything. For the penalty from stealing from a blood brother was death. The chieftain was now friendly, doing all he could for Stanley, and Stanley was amazed that how, at this ritual, it so changed his attitudes, the attitudes. For he did not quite understand the magnitude of the covenant. The question is, do we understand covenants? I don't think so, but today gives us a beginning of digging in, and I want you to dig some more and learn and read. I'll give you some more verses here. When we come to the Lord's table, are we going through a ritual that we little think about? Or do we think mainly about what God has done for us and what he'll do for us? It says in Romans that we need to present our bodies a living sacrifice unto him, Romans 12. One through three. All right, turn if you would please. Again, I won't be able to get through all eight pages again, but I'll do the best I can. Let's go to Ecclesiastes. Yeah. Well, where's that? It's in the Bible. Look in your table of contents, you'll find it. <clears throat> Chapter four. Hallelujah. If I have time, I'll come back to this other verse, but I'm going to skip it for now. I'll post it on heartofthehills.com so you can see all the verses I had up here for you. While you're turning to Ecclesiastes 4, listen to this. I'm going to use a practical example. What happens in a covenant is that two unequal people become one. Husbands and wives understand this. Understand this. In the covenant of marriage, one man and one woman, they're very different. Have you noticed that men and women are very different? We just picked up a book that, uh, well, Don recommended it to uh, Morgan and she got it. And we found another one at, the, at a garage sale the other day. Men are like waffles, women are like spaghetti. I started reading it for myself. Great book. We men, we're like waffles. Tragedy can be going on in the next square of the waffle, but we're over here. Comfortably in this square. <laughs> Amen? And the women are going like, why aren't you feeling this? I don't know. I'm over here in this square. <laughs> you know? What's that? The game's on. The game's on. <laughs> yeah, that's this square. And another square. And we, we, we can compartmentalize so easily. And yet, the book, and don't blame me, ladies, I didn't write it. The, book, the author said, women are like spaghetti. So you can touch one part of the emotion, it goes, and touches everything. Amen? And that has to be controlled. The mind has to be renewed. And gentlemen, we have to understand. But ladies, you need to understand, too, that we have to work at it. We men... Unless we go through some pressure and pain, we never grow up. We stay in about four little squares of our waffle. <laughs> that's it. You know, you can think about those four squares. All right, that's it. You know, four squares. But Jesus, even though he came and was born as a male human, yeah, he went through some pain and some pressure, didn't he? And he also studied the scriptures and got great revelation. And he had compassion. He was able to move freely between the squares. And man, we, us off the subject, but we need to be able to do that as well. 
We need to become empathetic. We need to feel. Went to a counselor years ago. First time I went for marriage counseling. And the counselor said to me, how do you feel? And I said, well, I'm, he said, I didn't ask you how you am. I ask you, how do you feel? Well, I'm gonna, I didn't ask you what you're gonna. I asked you how you feel about what's going on in your marriage, in your life. And I really had to think about it. It's like I had to push down the wall of one of those waffle squares and look into what was really happening in my life. And I, I said, I hurt. He said, good. Good. Because you do. You just, you, you, you bottle it up. It's over here. It's compartmentalized. You know, we men need to grow and learn and how to love our wives and treat them like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it instead of staying in the little waffle boxes. <laughs> I love that. I have to thank Don for that. All right, by now you found, oops, I have one more, one more thing to read before we... A covenant makes two very different kind of people, one man, one woman, in a marriage, one. Very different, but a beautiful union when God is in it. A little over three and a half years ago, Linda and I got married, and we entered a covenant where we became one. Our families united, and everything I have became hers. And whatever she had stayed hers. <laughs> No, everything she had and owned became mine. The responsibility of children and stuff, our life together. It's been awesome. Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer, I'll say this and I'll go back and read the verse. Jesus said Lord, in the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And if Jesus told us to pray that, it's possible. Amen? If it wasn't possible, it wouldn't be fair. I'm telling you, folks, it's possible to have heaven on earth because we have it. And you husbands and wives, you could have it too by realizing your covenant, realizing everything is yours is hers and hers is yours. And what a glorious we can stand together, but three are even stronger. Let me read that in, in Ecclesiastes. In Ecclesiastes 4, verse 9, it says, two are better than one. Because they have a good reward for their labor. Again, not to belabor the point, but this morning, you know, we're trying to pack to leave for a week. and go, We're going to Tennessee after, right after service. So I won't be able to talk to anybody today. I'll be right out the door and gone. But I started breakfast and I walked away and I came back in the kitchen and Linda's doing part of the breakfast now too. She's chopping the fruit, you know, and then she had to walk away and I stepped right in. It's so cool to flow together. And some of the men were saying, what, cook breakfast? <laughs> that all about? Try it. You like it. Bam. You like it. What, me cook, do the dishes? What, me do the laundry? Hallelujah, spiritual men do dishes and laundry and cook. That's all I'm saying about it. Hallelujah. Jesus had fish ready for the men after his resurrection. Jesus cooked. Isn't that cool? And then we, we know he cleans because he cleansed our sins away. Hallelujah. Spiritual men, bud, I know you do. I know you do. You flow together. You're one together. It's a covenant. Now, let's, let's get that flowing together with God. We're taking, taking, taking. When are we going to start giving, giving, giving? Saying, yes. Jesus. Yes, Lord. Whatever you want. Dave, are you hearing, buddy? Whatever you want, Lord, I'll do. That's our part of the covenant. Two are better than one, Ecclesiastes 4 9, because they have good reward for their labor. For if one fall, the other will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up again. If two lie down together, they will keep warm. But one, how can one be warm alone? Though they may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. That's husband and wife in Jesus. Powerful combination. I totally recommend it. 
All right, now turn, please. Yeah, I, I won't be able to go back to that one. Let's finish this one. Ephesians 5. Let's look at another covenant. Let's look at what the Lord has to say. Amen. Ephesians 5, and those of you who know your Bible, if you're thinking, you know, 525, you're thinking, wives, submit to your husbands, and all the men are saying, hallelujah, amen. Come on, brother, preach it. <laughs> There's more to it than that. It starts off in Ephesians 5.21. Look at it in your own Bible first. Sometimes I use this verse in a wedding service. It's not as popular, <laughs> but sometimes I use it. Ephesians 5.21, it says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wow. wow. And that can be interpreted again. God, we're submitting to God. We're the bride of Christ and we're supposed to give to him just like he's given to us. What's he given to us? Everything. What do we give to him? Everything. That's the only time we can ever have complete fulfillment in this life. Trust me. All right, Ephesians 5, 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So you're supposed to submit one to the other. No, after you. No, after you. No, you have it. That last piece of pie. No, you go ahead and have it. I'd rather you get fat than me. No, 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 no. Yeah. It's what they say, you have the left piece of the pie. I'll eat some, you can have what's left. <laughs> yeah. So after you've submitted to each other, here's a beautiful uh, way that God you know, showed us that this thing works as husbands and wives. Wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. I love the word submit in another translation. It says to mold to. Mold to. To work together in harmony. Those are root words of the word submit. It's not so much, you submit because I'm the husband. I don't see that attitude in the rest of that verse. So the word submit really is to mold to or to make your life help, to help meet. So wives, molding to the husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church, his body, of which he is a savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so wives also submitting to their husbands in everything. And by the way, gentlemen, I've always felt like this is the best balance on the subject. Try to agree about everything. You know, agree on a budget, agree on finances, agree on this and that and the other thing. That's always the best for peace in the home. When you come to the impasse, that the decision has to be made and you just back and forth and you can't make the decision, guess whose responsibility it is to make the decision? Not the right. See the difference? It's not your right. By golly, I'm the husband, it's my right. No. It's my responsibility. And all the fallout for good or for bad will fall on me because I'm trusting in God and there's an impasse and a decision has to be made so it's my responsibility so this is what we'll do as a family. And why is you can be praying? And the Bible says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 that if you acknowledge God and everything, he'll make your path straight. So even gentlemen, if you get it wrong... He'll fix it. He'll get you going the right direction. One way or the other. He'll do it for sure. See, God is real. And this stuff works. So just do it the way it says. You have a lot easier life. All right, so verse 25. Husbands, lord it over your wives and tell them you submit because I'm the husband. Bless God. Is that what it says? Wrong answer. Wrong answer. Eh, thanks for playing. Husbands, love your wives How? Husbands, you've never gone to the cross and shed your blood and had nails driven through your hands and feet and a crown of thorns for your wife. So don't you dare tell me that you have every right to be dominant. No. So you have to love your wives as Christ loved the church. Yeah, he's master, but he washed the feet of, the, of, his, of his disciples. He was kind. He was awesome. And yes, he was Lord. So yeah, guys, you are the head of the home, but act like Jesus, not Hitler. Amen? Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her 
to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Last example. I know I'm going on and on. One thing Linda can't get used to is that one night she wanted something, I don't know, something from the store or whatever, and I got up off the couch and I drove to the store and I got it and brought her home. She's like, wow. Oh, you did that for me? Yeah. If you want something else, I'll go back to the store. And, and this is our attitude because if you love yourself, if you love your wife as much as you love yourself, you know you'd have got yourself off the couch to get yourself something. Wouldn't you? No, <laughs> there's an honest man over here. Maybe. Well, if you maybe wouldn't do it for yourself, then maybe you wouldn't do it for a wife. I understand that. <laughs> but you see, that's being Christ-like. And that's being covenant people. Oh, this is just great stuff. So let me finish this verse. And then, Dan, I'm going to ask you to come if you've got a scripture or two for communion, and we'll uh, go right into that. It says in verse 28, In the same way husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds it and he cares for it, just as Christ does the church. For we are all members of his body, and for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. And verse 33 is something you need to chew on. Write it down and place it on the bathroom mirror or the refrigerator. However, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Men crave respect. Women crave love. Come together in that beautiful covenant of marriage. It's an awesome thing. Heaven can be on earth. I'm going to pray and turn it over to Dan. Father God, help us to see this covenant as something powerful, as something wonderful, that we've entered into covenant with you, that Jesus was cut and his blood flowed. And he cut the covenant with us. And when we, recepted, we received Jesus as our Savior, we became in covenant relationship with the Father. But Lord God, we don't realize what that means in America in this century. Open our eyes. May we realize now that everything that God has is at our disposal, but also everything that we have is at God's disposal at any time. And Lord, let us realize what a joy it is to serve you unfettered and in a full covenant relationship like that. Thank you for it. Open our eyes in Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.